Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we're going to be doing some integration bead prep. We're going to be taking on those funky limit problems that always show up in integration beads. They're pretty common because they force contestants to analyze the behavior of a function in a very different way from normal integration. And the problems we're discussing today come from the MIT integration bead from the quarterfinal rounds in 2022 and 2023. So here are the six problems that we're going to be going over today. Um, so the basic idea behind most of these problems is we have to sort of analyze the behavior of a function as uh, we take the limit as n goes to infinity. So we're usually going to be making a lot of simplifying ass assumptions, and a lot of these assumptions will have to do with um, finding what, what area over the region of integration actually contributes most to the value of the integral, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. And then we can also apply simplifying assumptions which are valid in that region. So some of those simplifying assumptions may be just taking the average value of the integral, or average value of the function, sorry, uh, making local linear approximations, or making asymptotic expansions, or even applying some interesting limit indeterminate forms. Uh, of course, some of these limits we'll just be able to sort of plug in directly, but for most of them we'll need to make some assumptions, as I've been saying. So uh, we're going to follow the steps below to go ahead and try and solve these problems. Not every one of these problems follows these steps exactly, but it's the same general idea with all of them. So one, we're going to make transformations and simplifications using algebra factoring and u substitution to get the integral into a nicer form. A lot of these problems aren't actually that tough once you've looked at them for a little while, but the first step is getting it into a nice and compact form without all these crazy constants all over the place. The second part, we're going to analyze the behavior of the function. So usually I just draw a little graph, figure out where it's increasing and decreasing, and figure out maximums and minimums and that sort of thing. And we want to determine what region of the integral contributes most to its value, because in the limit, what tends to happen is only, so for example, the maximum or minimum of a function will be the only part where the uh, integral actually accumulates any value when we go ahead and take that limit. So I'll show you what that looks like later. And then we're going to apply either a series, an asymptotic expansion, some sort of identity, or other sort of approximation. So we can make rough approximations which hold in that region that contributes most of the integral, which allow us to just go ahead and evaluate it. And then we can evaluate the integral and the limit. So let's take a look at how this works in a real problem. So here we have the limit as n goes to infinity of n times the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of tan to the n of x dx. Now the first thing we're going to want to do here is we're going to look at the graph of tangent x. So notice it's sort of concave up here and it's increasing at x equals pi over 4 which is the rightmost side of our integra integral. We have tan x equals 1. So something that you may notice here is that if we have uh, something that's less than 1 uh, and we take raise it to the n power it goes to 0 very very quickly uh, especially as we let n tend to infinity, right? So if this tangent function never reached 1, then multiplying it by n wouldn't affect the integral at all because it would just be such uh, a powerful 0 there. I mean, the limit as n goes to infinity of n over a to the n, where a is anything greater than 1, is just going to be 0. So really, the only part that's going to contribute to the value of the integral is this point right here, where tangent x equals 1. So essentially we can make some assumptions that only hold in this region or very close to this point where tangent x equals 1 and they will still allow us to recover the value of the integral because again the contribution from right here is 0. For example we could start integrating from pi over 8 to pi over 4 and this integral would have the exact same value because in this integral from 0 to pi over 8 tangent x is so small that when we raise it to the n power it just disappears completely uh, so much so that multiplying it by n still gives us a result of 0. So, we only care about the region of the integrand near x equals pi over 4. So how does tangent to the n of x act around x equals pi over 4? So we're going to make a local linear approximation of tangent x around x equals pi over 4. First of all, tangent of pi over 4 is 1. And if we differentiate tangent of x and evaluate it at x equals pi over 4, we get 2. So our local linear approximation is going to be y equals 2 times x minus pi over 4 plus 1. Now we're going to be taking the limit as n goes to infinity. And uh, we're going to have n times the integral from a to pi over 4. Again, a can be anything less than pi over 4, since we only care about the value near pi over 4, because again, nothing else is going to contribute at all. And we just go ahead and substitute this in. Now, integrating this is easy using u substitution, so I won't bore you with that. We just integrate right here. This limit, n over n plus 1, is just going to go to 1. And then this integral right here, 
uh, the limit at pi over 4 just evaluates to 1 half, and the limit um, outside of pi over 4 is again just going to go to 0 because this is less than 1 and we're raising it to the n plus 1 power. So our final answer is 1 half. Another easier method, but one that's a little bit harder to see, is after we substitute u equals tangent x, we get this situation right here. And notice again, we only care about the region of integration near u equals 1, because when u is less than 1, it just disappears, and even multiplying it by n, we'll still have it be equal to 0, essentially. So we find that 1 over u squared plus 1 is approximately equal to 1 half near u equals 1, so we can just substitute that in and then evaluate this integral to 1 half. Pretty easy. So finding approximations is the key to solving most of these problems. So often that's just going to be a local linear approximation, however sometimes we're going to have to find other types of approximations like analyzing asymptotic behavior. So limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times the integral from 0 to n of cosine squared of pi x squared over 2 dx. Now notice first of all when we, div when we multiply by 1 over n and then integrate from 0 to n we're actually finding the average value of the function between 0 and n. So that's going to be important. Let's take a look at the graph of cos squared of pi x squared over 2. If we go ahead and just graph it out, notice that it's just going to sort of oscillate, and it's going to oscillate getting faster and faster and faster as we increase. And I, this is not a very good graph, but clearly we can see that it oscillates, and it actually oscillates around y equals 1 half. So that's already a pretty good guess, just to go ahead and say, well, I mean, since it's oscillating around y equals 1 half, the average value of the function is probably 1 half, and you could just write that down right away. So we just have to find the average value of the function from 0 to n. It's pretty clear that it should be 1 half. However, a, a better way to actually go ahead and show this is we can use the uh, identity of cosine squared of u, and we get 1 half plus cosine 2u over 2. This is the oscillatory, oscillatory term, and this is the, argue, uh, the average value of the function. So now when we go ahead and integrate it, this is obviously going to be n over 2. So we're just going to get 1 half from this. And this integral over here is actually finite. It evaluates to roughly... Um, I think it evaluates probably to like 1 over square root 8 or something. I'm not really certain. It doesn't matter. But this is going to be finite. And so when we multiply by 1 over n, it's just going to disappear, and our final answer will be 1 half. So this was a behavior around a horizontal asymptote. Well, actually not a horizontal asymptote, but asymptotic behavior as we let um, x tend to infinity. But now let's look at the behavior of a vertical asymptote. This is another problem. So here we're multiplying by epsilon to the fourth and integrating from 0 to pi over 2 minus epsilon. Now clearly, when we integrate from 0 to pi over 2 minus epsilon, this tangent to the fifth of x is going to blow up because this is what tangent x looks around, looks near pi over 2. However, this sort of blowing up behavior is going to be neutralized by this epsilon to the fourth, or so we hope. That's how they design the problem. So the first thing we're going to want to do whenever we have an asymptote is we want to figure out what the type or order of asymptote it is. So we can do this sort of in a similar way to finding the residues of poles, but anyway, if this is a first order, uh, I don't want to say pole, but I, that's just the word I'm going to use here, first order, singularity, pole, asymptote, whatever you want to talk about, then when we multiply by x minus pi over 2, and then take the limit as x goes to pi over 2, we should get a finite, non-zero, non-infinite number. And it, it turns out if we go ahead and take this limit, we actually get negative 1. So that means that this is a first order pole, and it also means that it's sort of inverted. So while 1 over uh, 1 over x looks sort of like this, tangent x is sort of flipped over and negative. So this means that tangent x is going to uh, approximate minus 1 over x minus pi over 2 near x equals pi over 2. So we can actually go ahead and just substitute in this value here, and that will actually give us the same result whenever we're dealing with all of the value of the integral comes from coming from the asymptote. So here, we just go ahead and substitute this in. Again, this lower bound a here doesn't matter because the whole value of the integral comes from the contribution near the asymptote. Integrating this is pretty easy. Um, we're going to get this one fourth term here from just from integrating power rule, and then we're going to have this epsilon to the fourth, which is going to cancel on the top and bottom. This term over here is just going to be some normal finite value, but when we multiply by epsilon to the fourth, it's just going to go to zero. So our final answer is going to be one fourth. So usually, all we have to do is find the order of the pole and its coefficient, and then go ahead and sub in that term into the integral, and then just go ahead and evaluate it from there. A super important identity with a lot of these problems. 
limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus a over n to the bn equals e to the ab. And another result from this is that if we go ahead and put 1 plus a n plus c over n squared plus d over n cubed and so on and so forth, and raise it to the bn, it's still going to be e to the ab because these terms are so small that they don't actually matter. So let's look here. Integral or limit as n goes to infinity of square root n times the integral from negative one half to positive one half of one minus three x squared plus x to the fourth to the n power dx. Now notice that this is going to be um, this is actually a decreasing function right here, it's decreasing from zero to one half and decreasing if we go from zero to negative one half also in that direction. So as we sort of leave the neighborhood of x equals zero, this is going to uh, decrease pretty quickly, but it, this is balanced by this square root n factor. So I kind of want to get the square root n out of here because it just does not look nice. Square root n is really tough to deal with as opposed to an actual power of n like n or n squared. So what I did here was I just took square root n dx and I made this du, which tells me that I'm actually substituting u equals square root n dx. And doing this, we get the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral from negative root n over 2 to root n over 2. And now, we actually have exactly the format of this limit right here. And it's super easy to evaluate it from here. We just go ahead and plug in the formula, and we get the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative 3u squared du, which is root pi over 3. Now, one thing I need to note here, we have to be very careful whenever we're trying to use a strategy like this. And the reason for that is notice as u becomes very, very, very large, root n, uh, coming near root n over 2, uh, the value of u of 3u squared is actually on the order of n, which is something that is not usually happening when we have this limit right here. This limit assumes that n is going to be much, much, much greater than a. But that's not actually true in this situation. Now, it is OK because we're subtracting this 3u squared. That means that this is still. Uh, this is still going to be raised to the n power, and we have something that's less than 1 raised than the, to the n power, which is OK. However, if this integral uh, went from, if the upper bound here was 2 times square root n, then this u to the fourth term would actually dominate over this uh, 3u squared term, and we'd have something that's greater than 1 inside this bound, and that is not OK. So that's something that you definitely have to keep an eye on. Whenever you have this 3u squared and u fourth that are on the order of n, you have to be careful that whatever is inside uh, and raised to the n power is either infinitesimally greater than 1, infinitesimally less than 1, or less than 1. So yeah, so that's this integral right here using the Gaussian integral. Here's one last integral right here. Actually, this is not the last one, but this is one that I thought was a little bit interesting because we actually don't have to make any approximations here. So the first thing I did when I saw this problem is I just sub I just wanted to get rid of, rid of this x to the negative n. So when I made this substitution, it simplified over to this integral right here. And notice we can just plug in the limit directly. As n goes to infinity, this is just going to become 1. And we're just going to end up with sine v over v, which integrated from 0 to infinity is very famously pi over 2. No need to overcomplicate anything in this situation. So this is probably one of the toughest problems here because it requires some very, very, very in-depth thinking. Now we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity and we're taking the nth root of the integral of this raised to the n power. Now the first thing we're going to do is just go ahead and factor the inside. And when we do that, we get negative x minus 1 to the fourth minus x minus 1 squared plus 3. I'm sorry, that wasn't exactly factoring. But what I meant was simplifying the inside because it it actually was pretty clear here that it follows a pretty straightforward pattern. Since we have this minus x to the fourth and 4x cubed, I decided just to condense it into the form of x minus 1. So after doing this and, and performing u equals x minus 1, we get this nice little expression right here. Now notice that as we go away from uh, sort of x uh, u equals 0, all we're going to get is uh, this is just going to decrease away from u equals 0. So Something that's important whenever we have this situation, when we're raising it to the n power and then we're taking the nth root outside the integral, is whenever we have a to the n, or a is greater than b is greater than 1, then a to the n is going to be many, many, many magnitudes greater than b to the n. 
when we're taking the limit as n is co goes to infinity. And it's actually going to dominate over b to the n in any situation. Like, for example, the nth root of 3 to the n times epsilon is going to be 3 for all epsilon greater than 0. And we can even add some a to the n and b to the n. As long as a, to the a and b are less than 3, this is again just going to be 3. And in this case, this is really just an exacerbated version of this identity right here. We just have a to the n, b to the n, and a bunch of different numbers raised to the n power. If you think about an integral, it's just an infinite sum, right? So for our integral at the point where u equals 0, we have some very, very small, some very, very small differential, which is multiplied by 3 to the n. And then if we move to the right or left, we have some very, very small differential that's multiplied by some number a little bit less than 3 to the n, and then a number that's even a little bit less. However, throughout all of these different constants that are added, the only one that has any effect is this biggest constant, which is 3 to the n. And because of this expression right here, it's just, again, I just said it's like a, a it's just a sort of a more complicated version of this expression. Overall, our answer is going to be 3. And in general, if we have the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the integral from a to b of f of x to the n power dx, this is just going to be the maximum value of f of x for x in a, uh, for x between a and b, as long as f of x is greater than 0. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this video helped you better understand this type of problem and prepared you to answer more in the future. Please let me know if you like this style of video and if you want to see more Integration B videos or where you want to see this channel going. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.